that brought it knocking back at my door. And it was, it, the amazing thing is, is um, when someone in your family is murdered, like how do you respond to that? Well, my sister had been missing for two years. Mm -hmm. And um, so by the time her remains were found, we had no idea, you know, I mean, it's not something that was identifiable that we could say, oh yeah, that was Kathy. You know, it was just, it, it wasn't that way. And, you know, some things evolved out of that. Um, and it became a death penalty case um, right here in New York State. We still have death penalty at that time. So that's kind of like what nudged me back into this work in a different way that I thought I'd be doing the work. Um, and so it put me in from this way. And so what did I do with that? Um, I basically started getting involved with other organizations that um, provided some kind of services for victims and, and tried to figure out how that all worked and tried to understand that process. And what I found is, you know, there were a lot of, there were a lot of organizations out there, but there weren't a lot for like siblings, for someone who had a sibling murdered. So, you know, that was kind of hard too. And, and the support for a sibling was, you feel like you're in the room and your loss is not as great as obviously my mom's loss, right? She lost her daughter, I only lost a sister. You know, my daughter, she only lost an aunt. She didn't lose a mother. My sister's children, they lost a mother, but you know, their mother was not, was not the best person according to all the newspapers and everything else because she was she had an addiction problems so that's kind of like the cycle so I just wanted to lay that out there just to lay a little foundation because what was extremely moving for me and you know it was like an epiphany I guess that you make is when um, when all this was going on, it was just so much in the news. I mean, you couldn't get away from it, it was 24 seven. And then, you know, then it dies down and then it comes, then it, then, um, then it comes back again. And my mother and I actually did travel and have a victim offender dialogue here in New York State um, and that whole thing and visited him and got to, you know, hear his story. That was the only time we were really part of the process, if that makes sense. And where we had a voice where we could actually talk and ask him questions and, and have that kind of conversation. And you know, it was really important for my mom to go there, like her intent was to go there and to be able to sit in front of him and tell him she had forgiven him. That was like really important to her. And because she felt she had, but she didn't know until she was actually able to do that. And so, again, these are all like really long stories, so I'm trying to give you an edited version. But I wanted to bring you there because that was the last time that we left Attica. And when we left Attica, because that's where he was incarcerated, my, you know, we're on this victim of, a notification system where if, if he changes from one place to another, or this happens, or anything happens, we're supposed to be notified. Right, so that we can figure out, you know, it might be, if it might be a safety thing, it might, whatever the need might be, so that we can make sure that our needs are gonna get met. Um, well, what ended up happening is he ended up, he ended up dying. Okay, and, and you may say, well, that that's gonna, get a whole bunch of different emotions and reactions. And the reason why I gave it a little bit of backstory is because I was kind of caught in that place. I didn't really know I was, we, I knew all along that we had a relationship and that I had been forced in, my family had been forced into a relationship with him because of what he had done, right? Um, that was the only relationship we really had or we would have never of cry cost past. And so now here we were forced into this relationship, but now the relationship's over with, 
And how do you explain to people how you're you're kind of grieving and you're kind of like, you know, like you just don't know what to do with the feelings. You don't, because nobody kind of understands, like this is like a grief period to go through. And then, and then you're taking that and you're so kind of screwed up over that and not knowing what to do with it. But compound that with the press, with the media. That's how we got our notification. We didn't get the notification from victim services like we were supposed to. We got it from the reporter who calls my mom and says, this is the next day. So they have already know, they're contacted. They already know, it's big events. And so he's calling to find out how we feel about the death of him. It's like, really? You know, so, so the lesson learned, okay? So I'll just give my one of those lessons learned because every bit of work that I do nowadays, it all goes around lessons learned, I think. But it's, it's about creating an opportunity for us to have action and hold someone accountable, but at the same time, be able to have healing going on, right? So, and you know, I tried to, I tried putting everything into neat little boxes on one side, on the other side, um, person that was harmed, person that was harmed. And you know what? All my boxes were the same. I mean, do, do um, people who do harm need, need additional services? Absolutely. Do people who have been harmed need additional services? Absolutely. And so that's why I say, if we can just figure out a path of manifesting that harm to a place where we can all be in a better place, that's what I strive for. Okay, thanks, sorry. Thank you, Marie. You brought up so many topics that we'll, as a panel and together with you, sort of dive deeper into over the next uh, bit of time here. Erica Ford, can you tell us about your work? Um, my name is Erica Ford, and she stated, um, December 12th, 1987. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, December 12th, 1987, I set foot on a journey to do something different with my life and help to provide the tools that young people need to live a better life than the lives of their parents who were dying or going to jail in the uh, crack epidemic. And I was 22 years old at that time, and I'll be 50 in next month, in 31 days, and I haven't looked back. And on that journey, or in that first day, when I sat in, in, in a church upstate Goshen County, and listen to people, I was inspired to do something different with my life. And I hope that today, as we have this conversation, that there might be something that I say or something, question that you ask that I answer in a certain way that would inspire one of you to join me in the journey that I'm on to, to not only make peace a lifestyle, but to deal with, as, as Marie just said, helping the victims on both sides of the gun. Um, and understanding that the interconnectedness of our being allows certain things to happen when we live in a state of poverty, when we leave, live in a state of institutional racism, that it is our imperative duty to commit our lives to something other than ourselves and make change and, and make happiness in young people's lives a reality. So that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Eddie, can we hear from you? Yes, I'm Eddie Conway, and I've spent the last 44 years in the prison system working with prisoners, so I've had a close, personal, upfront uh, relationship with a lot of violence. Uh, and one of the things that, that grew out of that was myself and Dominique Stevenson, we organized a mentoring program because the violence was so rampant in the prison system. People just don't commit violent acts out in the community and then go into the prison system and become angels, you know. So a lot of the relationships and a lot of the conflicts are resolved by violence. 
so we decided to address the violence on that end. And one of the things that we learned creating a program called Friend of a Friend was that a lot of people didn't understand their history, didn't understand who they were, did not really have a good sight picture of their worth. And so that Friend of a Friend program and the mentoring program was set up to design to help people kind of like understand who they were, their history, uh, the, to be able to appreciate their value and the value of life, and also understand their role in the community with the aim towards sending them back in the community to be positive entities, or if not positive, at least not negative, neutral. Uh, and, it, and we did that, but in the process of doing that, we also made a determination in the prison system when we were working with a lot of, and it's primarily a male Senate kind of program, because it's in the male prisons. <laughs> We were working with young men and older men, and they became aware of the destructiveness that they had like uh, 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 imposed upon the community, and they decided that they were going to change uh, what they do in the future. You could see like a little light come on in their eyes, and they realized, okay, I can do better. I can work in the community in a different way. I can create a different future. But then you also see that light dim almost immediately after that because they realize, well, damn, I'm here for 10 years or 15 more years. And so one of the things that inside we decided to do <coughs> was that if we got out and when we got out, if we could work together, we could start reaching the guys before they came in. So we have two components of the program now, a friend of a friend inside the prison and a coalition of friends outside that works with a high school, works with a project area, and we now work with young men and young women from anywhere from six to 15 uh, to catch them and get that light turned on in their eyes before they get into the system. And so uh, that's the work we've been doing for the last 10 years or better. Uh, and um, it's been effective in this sense. And I'll just give you one story, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. When I went into one prison in 2009, there was a murder <coughs> in that prison every week. There's 2,000 men in the prison. There was a murder, and this is Jessup Correctional Institute, so you can check it. Uh, a murder every week in that prison. And we started working this program, the Friend of the Friends that had started in other prisons. And we, we brought together members from the street organization, the Crips, the Bloods, the BGF, the, uh, the uh, Murder Inc., uh, Dead Man Incorporation, et cetera, all the different all the different organizations, and the, the Muslims, the Christians, and so on, brought them in the room together and start and trained a core group of them and had them start taking responsibility for working with the population. And two years ago, they actually created a truce in that prison, and there's been no murders in that prison for the last two years. The agreement across the whole entire prison is that if you got a conflict, you got fights, no weapons are involved. Take it in the back, take it around the corner, work it out. Even the, the organizational fights, they agree, well, we're going to send 20 men down here, you're going to send 20 men down here, you're all going to fight until the police tear gas, you all beat you all, take you all away, which is not happen. It, it actually happens, and but there's no stabbing. I mean, so, I mean, that's the best we could do, but that is significant. But okay. Thank you. Dr. Drucker. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I, I come here via a long road. I'm an older guy at this point, and 
uh, I started off as a psychologist working in Brooklyn with gangs and early years of drug wars. Uh, and uh, at the time that deinstitutionalization was taking place, the closing of the mental hospitals, uh, dumping people out in the streets basically because the concept was that there'd be community-based care centers, community mental health centers, and they never materialized. President Kennedy had been the person behind it, and he was assassinated. The money was going into the Vietnam War. And to make a long story short, it never happened. So in essence, the closing of the mental hospitals, which was necessary because they were harmful institutions, except that they, 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 they were a, a sanctuary of sorts for the seriously mentally ill, whose families could not possibly take care of them without some system in place at the local level. And uh, it turns out that this became uh, the model for the abandonment of responsibility on the part of the state and the government for vulnerable populations. And that's, that's carried over to healthcare today, for example. So I, I wound up going into a drug treatment work. I ran a large drug treatment program in the Bronx for 20 years, 1,000 patients, methadone program. Uh, and those were many of the same people who, from families that had been affected by the abandonment of responsibility for mental health services in the city. Uh, at a time that the drug markets were surging. Uh, uh, heroin was always there, but it, it came up, and then cocaine and crack came along. And the industry, the drug industry, the drug, the drug, which is the basis of the drug wars that took place from 75 to 95, um, and uh, uh, it was very obvious that, that programs, clinical programs, while necessary for the individuals, never addressed the structural issues that were driving these markets, driving the family vulnerability to drug addiction and drug and drug use, because they were someone was in the business and someone else was in the hospital and someone else was in jail. And as they amped up the enforcement of the drug laws, uh, the Rockefeller, starting with Rockefeller here in New York, became a model for all the states, uh, and the recognition by, by by politicians that this was a very useful uh, way to ride. Uh, and, and build careers around uh, demonstrating being tough on crime, tough on tr drugs was crime, they were tough on drugs, they were tough on crime. Uh, Attica, the story we know about, was a piece of that. Uh, it happened in 71, and Rockefeller in 73 with the Rockefeller drug laws was showing his bones around, around that, that case. And I saw the wonderful piece by Tom Robbins uh, in the Times and the story of the, of the prosecution of these three guards who beat the hell out of this guy with witnesses years ago, and uh, it turns into another demonstration of impunity for correctional officers that they get away with murder, basically, and not be held accountable. And it's, it's Ferguson, same story, Eric Garner, the same story. It needs some big kind of plates that are moving around now, and we have we have a moment uh, that, that things are very dynamic and have to think about how, how we deal with it. So I, I'm particularly interested in uh, the issue of mass incarceration and ending mass incarceration, incarceration, which in simplest terms means getting a lot of people out of prison who are in prison now. Well, in fact, we already do that. One third of all the people in state and federal prisons come out every year. About 650,000 people out of the two million who are behind bars, if not jail, let's say, come out every year. Uh, but what happens is they go right back in at a very high rate, over uh, so the system is designed in a way through uh, the conditions of parole uh, to, to make sure you violate the drug test or associating with the wrong kind of people and you're not allowed to associate with anyone else, you don't have a home, so you're, you know, you're, you're, you're vulnerable as can be. And the system feeds back on itself and perpetuates itself. So you heard maybe a few years ago that there had been the first downtick in the, in the prison population in the United <coughs> States third of 1%, <coughs> the tiny number, that's gone now. The prison system continues to certainly hold its own at 2 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's the environment that I'm interested in. How do the communities that already absorb a large number of people out of prison, uh, and many of them uh, do not have stable lives and go back into prison while they're in the community, dragging others with them as they do that, caught up in these, in these, in these papers. and. Um, how do we design a community that can accommodate, give sanctuary to, give help to, give support for the populations who have been victims of these mm -hmm. very, very um, 
deliberate campaigns for mass arrest, mass incarceration. We have a piece here from uh, half of all black males in the U.S. are arrested by age 23. When you have an engine running at that speed and the contact that that implies, the level of it, it doesn't have to be that efficient to always keep pushing people to stop and frisk with the New York uh, the peak of that. So uh, in terms of violence, that's the structural violence that, 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 is, that, that underlies the thing we're talking about. And it plays out in individual cases. You know, in prison, a closed environment, we understand it. You know, this cell block, this guard, these guys, and how that's structured. Uh, once it's out in the wider world, it's the same sort of structural violence, but on a much larger scale. Thank you, Dr. Drucker. I think that brings us uh, to an interesting question, which is, uh, you know, you raised the issue of the cycle of people in and out of prison. I think Marie raised the issue of the cycle of, of harm that comes. You know, when you're harmed one time, you'll harm again. If you've been harmed, you may be more likely to cause harm to others. So, you know, I'm interested to hear the panelists' thoughts on, uh, you know, how do we address, how do you, in the work that you do, and then how do we, you know, sort of the, the more um, focused and deliberate question of how do you address the issue of violence, but also, you know, how, do, how should we as a society address the issue of violence? So what, what, how we address the issue of violence is in a holistic manner. Um, one of the things that we recently did was we took a model to the New York City Council, which is the New York City crisis management system, and it looks at violence as a disease. And at its foundation is the cure violence model that deals with credible messengers. So as um, Brother Eddie raised, uh, the brothers who are the leadership of these street organizations are trained to be the fixers of the problem. And then we also look at it as a systemic problem. So the system is, is, a, is a foundation of, of violence interrupters and outreach workers that work with high-risk level three shooters but it also provides a therapeutic process to the people who are doing the healing as well as the people who are the victims. So in one instance, we work with all family members or individuals who've lost loved ones, whether it's your, your homie or it's your sister, brother, mother, father. And we provide therapeutic services, both professional and unconventional therapeutic services, because we know a lot of people don't want to get therapeutic services. But we also know that hurt people hurt people. So that if you are witnessing violence, whether it's domestic violence in your house or it's systemic violence outside of your house or it's institutional violence at your school, those things rub off on you. And how it impacts you on a day-to-day -day basis, one never knows. Um, so we deal with, one, bringing educational consciousness. So we're in the school in terms of providing services to those same high-risk individuals, the people who have the potential to be shot or shoot someone, as well as um, the people that they impact. And um, we provide job services. We provide, you know, the basic services that you need on a day-to-day -day, day life. And then the other aspect of how we deal with, we can deal with it on, on a large basis is particularly like why we're all here now. To me, this is marketing and promotion. Educate, organize, mobilize. You know, that you have to constantly win people over to your side. So I, if I didn't come here today, a lot of you I would have never met in my life, you know. Um, so participating in different kind of things brings together different people who normally would not talk to each other and share ideas on what we can do and how we can spread the word. Because the more of us whose consciousness have, have risen, then things change. So when we first started 10 years ago trying to get them to institutionalize our program, it didn't work. But after raising consciousness and doing campaigns and both PSAs, songs, billboards, so on and so forth, and just lobbying people, then different mindsets changed and different people got into office. Who you were, he once was like de Blasio, believe it or not, he used to come to all of our rallies, right? So he saw our growth process and saw what we were doing. So now some of our work is being institutionalized and funded. And, you know, so that way we all play a role in spreading the word and, and developing the concept. And then on the other side, like I sat with a professor here at Columbia because I don't develop the blueprint. That's not what I do. I have the vision and the ideas, but some of you are the people who put the pen to the paper and can write it and translate it into the language that is needed when you're going to an institution to institutionalize the program. So we, sh we work together, because all of our work is interconnected, 
and our existence is interconnected. So, you know, that's what we do. We, we use out-of-the-box methods to approach a problem that some people think can never be fixed. Thank you. Any other panelists want to comment on, uh, you know, you have your 100% solution to violence? <laughs> we would like to know. <laughs> I just wanted to comment on what Eddie said about um, when he said, well, we don't have, you know, but we made, I don't remember exactly what you said, but something about, you know, they got them to lay down the shanks and that and, and duke it out, whether it be, whether they had to do that physically or whether they had to do that with the words or whatever. And so they were feeling more, you know, that's what that's what we've done in some of the schools. I worked with some of the schools in in, de, in starting to have some restorative circles. In the morning, they're they're getting breakfast at that school, and I'm like, it's an ideal time, you know. Like instead of everybody sitting in their own private little things, they just circle up now. So it's really amazing when you watch the kids go and it, this is a kid in a poverty i mean this is a school it, it constantly hits that report card saying it's a failing school and it's got you know way way more failures than than everything else but um and th these kids are coming from all kinds of conditions you know i mean there's poverty there's there's domestic violence there's you know, just getting to school is an accomplishment and staying in school is another accomplishment. And so in watching them actually be able to all of a sudden say, okay, everybody sit down, we're circling that. And that's, that's really powerful. Whereas before they would all circle it, but they'd all be standing and, and all around the people who were gonna be going at it. And they would be encouraging the two people to be, you know, so a lot of times the two people that are having a beef didn't even have the beef. So, and just by being able to have that, wow, that kind of aha moment, like this, this does work, you know, and there is a different way of doing this and it brings some, some not chaos to their chaotic well-being or their chaotic life and that. And just one other story was um, I'm also, I had been a foster parent, a therapeutic foster parent for a number of years. And, um, and one of the little girls that lived in my house, her response to everything was violent. And, um, and so it was, and then, then the question started coming for me, like, what do you mean? Doesn't everybody respond that way? Doesn't, you know, like, why, why is this not right? And, and then like, she would get to go home on the weekends. And then she'd come back and she'd say, why is it so different that the bullets aren't flying here and they're flying there? You know, our van got hit, our house got hit, the window got broke, you know, and those things. And so trying to adjust from point A to point B is like such a transition. So, but the thing that we tried to, um, you know, you, you don't want to take away all of our survival skills either but you want to help her try to or in this particular case it was her but try to use those other skills that she's never learned and, and a lot of times that that's what's happened so you know in, when we used to have triple f night it was forced family fun night you know so um you know so then she goes back home on the weekend and she's just like we gotta have force, you know, we gotta have triple F night. And they're like, triple F night, what's that mean? Fight, 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 you know, and, but no. And so she got them all playing games and sitting down and, you know, that they just never did that. Either if they were all in the same room together, they were killing one another, so, okay. Yeah, because there's, there's another aspect of this, this, this whole violence thing and how it, 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 it uh, developed. One of the things, in, in the state of Maryland, a lot of the prisons are 75 to 150 miles away from the urban centers. Uh, and it's important because the, the prison populations of 75 to 80% people of color and they're from the urban centers. The guard force, the custodians, et cetera, is from those rural areas. Mm -hmm and they're primarily 95 
and in some cases 99% white. In those prison situations that's so far away from the urban, from the, the place where the prisoners actually have a family support network, et cetera, a tremendous amount of abuse takes place in those prisons. And uh, a lot of times the prisoners react, a lot of times they get beat up, jumped on, gassed, put in a hole, uh, until such time that they're pacified. Mm -hmm. But an anger develops in these prisons, in, this popul in these populations, that don't respond to the guard force at some point, but they bring that back to the community. So, I mean, almost every year, well, well it's like Eric pointed out here, that half of the 23-year-old males end up in the prison system. 80% of them end up back home. Mm -hmm. And they come back home with this real anger, this real hostility, this real sense that the community have abandoned them uh, because they can't get the visits because it's 75, mm -hmm. 150, in some cases 300 mile round trip for their family. They see their family, you know, maybe once every other month. Sometimes they don't get visits at all. They are in great harm from the guard force. They internalize that and they blame the community for it. I mean, and, and this is important because when they come back to the community, even though they're angry with the guards, they're more angry with me for not saying anything or not speaking up or not looking out for them or letting them suffer that abuse. And as soon as I say something to them, as soon as I bump into one of them, there's violence. And, that, and so one of the things we have to realize is in order to, to kind of like start addressing this violent issue is to figure out who's manufacturing it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the drug trade is about money. So if this violence is about territory or if there's domestic stuff that's personal, but then a lot of the anger and hostility and frustration and the fatalism you find that's happening in just encounters. You stepped in front of me. You did this, you did that. That's stuff that's transferred aggression. One of the things that we try to do in Maryland is try to encourage people to start going into those prisons that are outlined in the rural areas to start shedding a light on them, to start, start interacting with them, uh, the prisoners, because what happens is the prisoners start seeing people from the community that's not their family or not their loved one. They start having a different kind of psychological attitude towards the community. Okay, somebody else cares about mm -hmm. us. Okay, I said, slow down or you want to ask a question. You got to save it probably. We, yeah, we're going to have a Q&A, so, yeah. so uh, jot yourself a note. They see people that are not connected to them, that mm -hmm. care about them, then they start seeing the community differently. Mm -hmm. So part of that is reaching Bringing it back. Can yeah. I, I think you raise a really interesting point. I've been, um, I have a four-year-old, and um, yeah, light of my life but asked so many questions, right? And lately he's been struggling with this idea of good guys and bad guys, right? Who's a good guy and who's a bad guy? And um, I feel, you know, maybe, uh, maybe my explanations are too heavy for him right now because I'm going into all this sort of, you know, theory from my work. But um, we, we know in, you know, sort of Eddie's example, once you leave the community, now you're not part of the community anymore. You're a community member or you're not, right? You're a victim or a perpetrator, and once you're a perpetrator, that's it. That's who you are now going forward, right? So, you know, I want to pose the question to the panelists. Um, how do you think about the ideas of victim and perpetrator, person who is harmed, person who has harmed, and the divide, sort of the two sides of the fence that exists in our criminal justice system, in uh, our media, um, our movies, our books, our fairy tales, all those things. It's such a deep-rooted sort of divide there. How do you think about it? What do you see in your work? 
We got to change the narrative. Tell us about you know, that, Erica. Um, we got to change the narrative. Even in listening to Eddie, um, when he's talking about manufacturing the violence, that the system itself is created for men. It's a, it's a business. Violence is a business. You know, and when we come to these conferences or engage in this work, we got to be real about what we can accomplish, you know, and what we're dealing with. Unless you're talking about straight up revolution and changing the system, then you're making band aid fixes along the way. And we got to be real with that. So that we're real with when we have a victory, we can celebrate our victory, we can share our victory. This conference, this is the fifth year, correct? How many times have a busload of people from the Bronx, South Bronx, Harlem, South Jamaica been bussed in to participate in this who are prisoners, families in prisons, victims of violence? Probably never. So the, the divide is that there's those people who are experts and then those people who are the problem or the victims. But they're not, they're the experts. Because they are the ones who survived the process and still can move on. And a lot of times we have people who jump into our community or jump into our issue and think that they're going to fix something, and they're not. You know, so we got to be real on what it is that we're doing here as students when we're studying social services, that we're not going to jump in somebody's community or look at them as not being an expert. But we're going to partner with people who are inherent to their problem and can understand their problem and understand that there's no such thing as a bad person or a good person. There's an act that I created that was not good, quote unquote. But there's a worse bad problem is the education system that destroys the minds of our children every day. Or the food industrial system that destroys our bodies and our systemic being to think and live and love. Because the food that we eat makes us angry. It makes us hostile. It makes us combative. So these people, when we see these children, in fo you're being bustled like a damn I don't even know what, from one home to the next home, to a floor in a building. What do you want me to do? So when we look at these definitions and right ways and wrong ways that are imposed upon us in society, we got to look at that's not for us. If we're committed really to the idea of beyond the bars or reforming or transforming injustice, you know, we got to be real on what that is and do our little part. Because we're not, we're not, like at one day somebody said, I can go to the moon. And they set forth to go to the moon. And different people did different things along that way to get somebody to the moon. And that's the same thing that we can do. People said that people wouldn't stop smoking. People probably said that in that prison, you never stop killings. But there's little things, and that's more important in terms of our conversation here today. Because I don't want to hear what Eric. I want to hear how we can work together to make some kind of small change. So when you come back here next year and you're on this panel, you can say that out of the panel last year, we did this. And we have this room filled of people from the South Bronx whose families are in prison so that they can share in the process of change. Because if we think we could do it without them, then we're fooling ourselves. And if we just want to hear somebody pontificate about what they do and how they do it, we're not interested in change. You know, so we've got to have real conversations about real solutions and real things and change the narrative of all of the shit that they throw in our head and tell us this is how we're supposed to live. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I mean, it's very hard not to get enraged about this situation. Maybe you the mic. You might have to sit it's forward really a little hard bit. not to get enraged when you understand what's going on, the dimensions levels of harm that it does, numbers of people who are harmed. And I don't just mean the, the victims of the criminal justice system or the victims of the crime. I think that Michelle Alexander was very uh, uh, very clear about the need for a transformative process, transformation. But what, what, what's the realm in which that transformation, the realm in which it has to take place? I think part of it is a clear understanding on everybody who wishes to be seriously engaged with these problems is to pick their spot, their sweet spot, where they can work. Um, some of us come out of a clinical background. What we can do is help individuals, help families uh, in a clinical way to deal with the traumas that they've been through and to help them, especially in groups, in peer groups, to build the strengths to survive in a, in a very toxic situation. 
And that has a lot in common with warfare, in which teams of people back each other up. That's the way they stay sane in an insane situation. Uh, but when, you're, when your membership in that group is stigmatized the way it is, is made to be a bad guy, mm -hmm. uh, you're not supposed to do that. And the level at which that, that becomes most important is the community level, because people come out of communities and go into prison. They come out of prisons, go back to those communities where they're invisible. Uh, I had a dream once about a flag. You know that prisoners of war flag they have with the guy with heads down? Imagine that for our prisoners of war. That, that went from being a sign of shame and stigma to being a sign of, um, I don't know what, it's victimhood's the wrong word. But if you look at the, uh, I work with veterans uh, from Vietnam War and, and these wars now, uh, and you hear the stories of exploitation and violence that they've been subjected to by their own commander, the disregard for life, the things they're expected to do, that story of the sniper, is another one of those. You know, this guy has to look through a, sni a sniper scope as he pulls the trigger and watches somebody's head explode a thousand yards away, day after day, hundreds of times. What human being is, is, is equipped to deal with that kind of uh, experience? And so, you know, you, 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 you basically poison somebody's mind, you poison their body. And where you happen to be working in that spectrum between the victim and the perpetrator, both of whom are human beings and have rights, I'll give you a concrete example of this. I work with a program through the Correction Association called RAP, which is Release Aging Prisoners uh, uh, Project. And uh, the purpose of that is to take the fact that aging prisoners represent almost no public safety risk. The, the jargon of the field of criminology and law enforcement is that the, the rationale for keeping these guys in prison forever is that the public safety argument has cracked. Because the public safety argument has no validity to that population. Most people who commit homicide, it's one time. They never do it again. Uh, and so they're